So we probably have about 20 minutes or so for, uh, for questions. So I can invite people to, to make concise questions. Uh, and before the question, can you just tell us, can you just uh, introduce yourself briefly? Thanks. Um, Paul Mosley, University of Sheffield. I'd like to invite Anna in the first instance to um, maybe develop um, his answer to the question, what do we need to do? But I'd also like to ask all the presenters if they would mind doing the same thing in the light of the differences which the book reveals between the countries which managed to reduce poverty a lot and the ones which didn't. And if they will, to do that in the light of the fact that Africa now is very distinctly the region of the world where poverty um, reduction performance is worst. And possibly, to be provocative, I could suggest a simple hypothesis which some people think explains this huge difference between Africa and the rest of the world, and indeed between different regions of Africa, which is that the ones which did reduce poverty did something serious about the development of smallholder agriculture, and the ones which didn't um, were not serious in their smallholder agriculture policies, and as a consequence, weren't able to increase yields and therefore, um, and that spread to the rest of the economy, and therefore poverty didn't reduce. Okay, thank you. Jukka and then Eric. Uh, yes, I'm Jukka Pirtila from University of Helsinki at UNU Wider. Uh, thank you for the, for the, for the very nice uh, presentations. Uh, I have uh, a couple of questions. Uh, first to uh, David on the, uh, and uh, I would like to ask the, uh, why your numbers on poverty differ a bit from the uh, those reported in by the World Bank? Can you give us some pointers on on the on the reasons for the difference? And I I know I should know this because I've seen the code, but I I, I no, don't remember now that the I mean what was it exactly that the utility consistence did for the uh, for the consumption basket? Was it, was it in fact something similar to what the Rwandan statistical authority, I believe, then did on purpose when they changed the basket to, to contain items that have a, a cheap? No. Okay, so my mistake then. But remind me, remind me, and maybe somebody else in the audience on <laughs> what it actually did. Uh, and uh, and then I, I I very much like them, Marike, your your talk and the um, I mean the idea of using these mixed methods. Um, I'd like to follow up on on Arne's point on on uh, whether we uh, is there a reason to worry about the reliability of the uh, of the findings in the for example DHS surveys. David, if I understood, if I understood it, you. Uh, use some kind of a least cost bundle. Uh, so you start with the caloric requirements, let's say 2,000 calories per day, uh, per male equivalent or what have you, and then you look at the least cost diet that gets you the 2,000. So my question is, the actual diet that is consumed by the households may be very different from the least cost diet. So you did say, say something about utility consistent. So I, I'd like some, some clarification of this point. Secondly, I was very surprised at the very low Gini coefficient for Ethiopia. I mean, it's, it's in the order of Scandinavia. Uh, it's much lower than the US, much lower than the UK, much lower than most European countries. I, is this real? Um, I mean, it, if it is, it's a very good sign, but uh, I raise this as an issue. Third point, and this has implications for AERC, the, the last date that you have is 2011. We are now in 2018. In the meantime, there's been steady growth in Ethiopia. The conditions now, I would speculate, are 
much better than they were in 2011. <coughs> now, I understand you had no choice because the 216 survey was not yet available. But I think it has implications for AERC. If AERC could try to speed up the analysis of existing surveys, facilitate the, the analysis uh, of existing surveys, and perhaps convince countries in the World Bank to conduct more surveys, this would give us a, a closer picture of the present situation so we don't always have to deal with uh, uh, past uh, trends. Um, then for uh, Mareike, the, the more she talked, the more I was reminded of the, uh, what I call the, the Heisenberg-Bohr principle in quantum physics, that if, if you observed a phenomenon, you essentially distort the phenomenon. The, uh, th this is true in quantum physics. Um, and and uh, I don't know if there's an answer to it, but clearly with a questionnaire, if you ask an a household a number of questions, they may give you answers either to please you or to avoid having to pay taxes. You don't necessarily get a, a true picture of reality. And, and I wondered if, uh, <coughs> if perhaps you had some ways of, of uh, uh, not solving this problem, but of, of making it less acute. Uh, thank you. Uh, we could take another couple of questions if people have Lemma. And yes, look, look yeah, Lemma. Just a couple of questions on, on Rwanda, the, the qualitative field work. Uh, I was just wondering, how does one go about validating qualitative uh, field work? Uh, that's one question. Uh, the second is, um, you know, the voice and accountability came up in Rwanda. And that's also endemic to Ethiopia. Uh, you didn't mention that. And I was just wondering what the role of this state-led kind of guided uh, development uh, would have, and also now we're actually going through some changes, right? So I think I think if you can actually opine on that, uh, that would be that would be useful. And I was even thinking about that the, the 2005 shock. Uh, have, have you seen any like changes as a result of the 2005 shock? I was actually looking at some of the numbers, <laughs> and I think uh, where I could see is some kind of uh, disaggregate um, uh, regions. You know, like you know, I, I was kind of impressed to see the, the kind of time variation in the Tigra urban, in the rural, and then Oromia, you know, and then and then the, the current movement actually was instigated mostly by the Oromia. So I, th I think I think the, the, the political economy dimensions need to be looked at, and and the, the question that was raised in Rwanda is it sustainable? Yeah, that uh, that same same question would apply to Ethiopia as well. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Luke Christensen from the World Bank. Uh, just following up on Lemma, maybe one change you saw in the data is, uh, which struck me when they did the disaggregation by the regions, is uh, the fact that poverty went down a lot in Addis between 2000 to 2005, from 30 to 10 percent or something, and then it stayed at 10 percent after 2005. What was one of the major criticisms of the during the elections in 2005 was that they're all catering to Addis. So the government must have taken some of that uh, message and kind of went even further away of, or invested more in the rural areas. But that as an aside. Uh, second uh, point uh, on Marek, to me an obvious thing to, to sort of cross-check would be to see what's happening in agriculture between 2011 and 2013. Now I noted that on your rainfall, on average, that was a little bit lower. That may not be enough to, to, ex to explain it. But sort of to look at the consistency, it seems to me it's an obvious thing to do. What's happening to yields, uh, maybe linking to Eric's point, there you could also use satellite data, some other ways of looking at it and just sort of survey data. It might be a way to, to sort of cross-check that a bit. Then the flip side, uh, I really like uh, your point, uh, David, at the end. So you say, look, what may have contributed to this poverty reduction in, in, in Ethiopia. And it was sort of interesting to see you really 
describing a package. You're talking about technological change, you're talking about agronomical, agronomic knowledge, extension agents, that's sort of on the production side. Then you talk about infrastructure, you're basically talking on the market side. So you're kind of working on both sides. And on top of that, you add something on risk, which is very critical for agriculture in order to facilitate some of that adoption. So while that kind of package working on these three fronts may not be coming together all the, all the time in each of these villages, Clearly, Ethiopia has been working on all these front, three fronts at the same time. I may want to add sort of a fourth element as a question. Uh, we also know that Ethiopia has been investing in trying to attract uh, labor-intensive manufacturing. I'm not so sure how much of that was already in place. I think it started after 2005, so to what extent was already there in 2011. So you really get this kind of... We're, we're producing, we're increasing staple crop productivity, which is what Ethiopia has done they may start to come to a point where you can get an accelerated release in a productive way of labor out of agriculture, then that has to go somewhere. Part of that might be absorbed in the rural non-farm economy, in the secondary town, sort of through higher domestic consumption, construction, non-traded goods and serfs, etc. But part of it can also be absorbed by the, the labor-intensive export-oriented uh, manufacturing. Flowers is not, this is like manufacturing. Uh, so flowers is one, but there's the leather industry, etc. So that kind of other angle of it, uh, is that something you have looked at or, or sort of to what extent it contributed, etc. or may, may that have come a bit after 2011 is sort of maybe more important now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've been wondering in the context of inequality for in Ethiopia, whether the case of expatriates has been considered. Um, there are many expatriates now, uh, um, I mean, retur uh, returning to the country as they reach retirement age or others with the better economic situation. Now, they have clearly a very high, much higher level of uh, savings and uh, resources as compared to the general population. Perhaps this has also contributed to inequality, but uh, they, m many of them are also us using these funds for investments in small-scale industry. So has there been a concentration of both aspects and uh, their implication for uh, inequality. Thank, thank you. Thank you. You're gonna. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ade. Um, I think Eric, I take your point. I think it would be very interesting if we were to update this uh, data. For example, in uh, I think there has been some surveys in 2018, 20, 2018, and maybe we're going to see some surveys coming up. It would be interesting, maybe, to contrast to see what has really happened. Thank you very much for that. But I think uh, the Kenyan case. I, am, I still didn't get it. Why is it so uninspiring? You know, that was your comment. Because I think, uh, Germano, you could have given us a set of factors. Why is it so uninspiring? And in fact, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, if I go out in Kenya, I, I'm a Kenyan, so I go out in different rural parts. And I can tell you that the situation is actually desperate. You can see it. Eh? So essentially, you don't even need data to compute that. You can actually corroborate that story about the uninspiring. But there has to be a problem. But that also means, you know, I, one time in 2007, Kenya was growing at around 7%. Uh, and one of the questions I used to get from the journalists is that, can you feel it? Where is this growth? It's the same question you can see. If we can show, at least I can, now it's evident about Kenya and the way it is, but if you go to Ethiopia, can you also see this kind of change, that poverty reduction? Is it feasible? You go to different parts of Ethiopia. It's the same question I would like to see. Uh, to see, to, to, to see is, is, can, you see, can you see it in terms of those many years of transform transformative changes and poverty reduction? Then. Can you see it? Is it visible? That's a, 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 perhaps an interesting question to see. Okay, thank you. If you can be brief, we'll allow one last question. Okay, the last question. Okay. Yes, my name is Holger Hansen from the University of Copenhagen. It's a very simple uh, comment, I would rather say, on Rwanda. 
Uh, I think we are a little bit left a little bit confused about the Rwandan situation, and I would ask: Isn't there a, a, a space or time or money to do an extra survey and uh, get a new set of data from for Rwanda, from Rwanda? I think it's it's needed because it's a very important case of a developmental state and how it performs and so on. So I think we would need to be updated. And then I could ask you: Will you equal the the, the data you have from uh, Philip Rangians with the uh, ones from David Booth and Mutepi? Uh, they seem to be very different, and uh, Philip Rangians is very well known for his, if I may say, rather subjective view on <laughs> Rwanda. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, let, let's come to um, let's come to. Res I mean, I don't want to encroach in our tea break too much, so let's come to responses from the different presenters. Uh, can we go in the same order that you presented, Germano? Do you want to respond first, David, then Mareka, and then Arne? Th thank you very much, Andy. So, just a, uh, an observation on uh, Kenyan case, why it is uh, not inspiring in terms of, okay, we have seen high growth rate, but uh, very little reduction in uh, poverty. Uh, even an inequality. Actually, inequality has come down a little bit, but uh, I think the, but okay. The, the answer is uh, partly because, uh, okay, in my presentation, I left out some information. The information I left out, which also Andy did not have, is uh, the results from the 2015 survey, which shows that um, even during the period where growth was not very high, between uh, 2008, and 2015, during that period, poverty came down by 10 percent, from 90, from 46 to 36 percent. Those are the that six percent that uh, from the recent uh, survey, 2015. So actually, something has has been happening in Kenya, which is positive. The the other observation about the Kenya is uh, when you walk around in Kenya, and you want to walk around in, in Ethiopia. Actually, from my perspective, you think that Kenya is doing better than Ethiopia. Okay. Uh, also, when you go to other countries like our neighbor in Tanzania, when you also walk around, you feel the same. You talk with I don't talk, I just, I just, <laughs> I just look. <laughs> The, the, when, when also in the, uh, also, uh, so this is qualitative data, right? When, when uh, researchers come to Kenya from, uh, during ARC meetings, they feel that actually Kenya is doing very well. Okay, anyway, uh, part of the reason is uh, an inspiring part. This information was actually missing. <laughs> A bunch of questions, so I, I'll, I'll do my best here. In two, um, two, or, three in two or three minutes. Okay. Uh, so uh, the first question: uh, What do we do? What do we do from here? Um, so uh, I'll take my perspective as someone who worked on Madagascar and, and Ethiopia, um, and contrast the two, and and, and uh, have two two points that come out of this. The first is political stability. Um, Madagascar has been repeatedly hit by shocks, political shocks, and and this has really kept them from. Uh, from moving forward, uh, which gets to the uh, kind of a question of how is this sustainable for Ethiopia, right? Uh, so that's a that's a uh, valid question, I think. But then the second is what Luke describes as as a package uh, of uh, of policies uh, that are you know geared toward infrastructure, you know, enabling agriculture uh, um, ex uh, extension and and uh, and the like. Um, and so that's that's my sense of, of you know the importance of agriculture, but also thinking about this as a as a, a package. Um, now, for um, some of the questions about um, the uh, the poverty numbers compared to uh, the World Bank numbers, it's it's the poverty line. Uh, the consumption aggregates are effectively the the, the same in, in, ter in nominal terms. So it gets to the the poverty line, which gets to the question of uh, what is the consumption bundle. So the consumption bundle is based on the caloric uh, requirements in in each of the spatial domains and based on the consumption patterns in the spatial domains. Um, the, the confusion that I uh, apparently have, have led out there was with the revealed preference tests, 
right? So the idea is that if, if relative prices change uh, from a, a base level, uh, then, then you would expect households to change some of their the the the, um, the composition of the uh, of the bundle. Don't use the word least cost. Yes. Well, that yes. Right. Something. Yes. But it, the idea is the least cost along the along the utility uh, along the indifference curve, um, and uh, and so the the entropy method is is meant to adjust those consumption patterns as little as possible so that you maintain uh, uh, utility consistency. Uh, and so I, I, I hope that, it, that, uh, that explains, uh, explains that. Um, low inequality, um, it, it strikes me as being uh, quite low as well. Um, though if you, if you think about the uh, majority of the population are uh, in rural areas, uh, the inequality um, is not that large um, among the uh, among the the rural population, and and I didn't get a chance to talk about it, but the it, it's mostly uh, within uh, uh, region uh, inequality that uh, that describes national uh, inequality. Excuse me. Um, between urban and rural, it's, no, it's yes, yes, but but most of overall, and when you break down the tile uh, inequality index, uh, eighty percent of that is eighty five percent of that is due to within uh, uh, region inequality. So, um, in, in terms of the the diaspora, um, um, your point is is uh, is certainly a, a valid one. Uh, it's, it's something that we can't. Uh, we weren't able to um, uh, identify that with the uh, with the data, but it's it's certainly something that uh, you know the the introduction of of investment that Arnie was talking about um, is uh, uh, the diaspora has been an important part of that. My understanding as well. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so thank you for all the the valid points and and the questions. Um, I will try to address each of the questions and but be very brief uh, for the sake of time. So first on Land, it's true, uh, Rwanda has been very active uh, on the front of uh, land and agriculture. So they have implemented land consolidation programs, uh, crop uh, specialization programs. They have distributed seeds, fertilizer, implemented uh, land reform. Um, there are some cr critics who say that this could have been better designed and implemented with more bottom-up uh, uh, strategies rather than top down so it's not ideal but it's probably better than doing nothing which is the case in for instance congo uh, a neighbor of uh, rwanda um, then on the dhs uh, is it uh, reliable well the dhs method is fixed because it has to be comparable across uh, countries and the, the 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 implementation is tightly managed by macro internationals so um I, in, in general, it's considered as reliable. Also, of course, the numbers flowing out of the DHS are rather positive and so uh, uh, would not never be contested by the regime. And I'm not so surprised that uh, indicators for health and education are positive because these are areas where you can uh, quite easily um, implement uh, top-down uh, all kinds of measures. Uh, vaccinations work uh, uh, at all time, at all places. We know that, but in the area of agriculture and livelihoods and economic transformation, it's much more difficult to work top down and figure out what works for whom and where. So I'm not so surprised that on the educa educational and health uh, front, uh, Rwanda is, uh, is performing well um, because they are well organized. So you can uh, uh, go a long way just by that. And then on, I got a bunch of questions on the uh, reliability of uh, qualitative uh, information. So. Uh, quantum physics, uh, yes, I'm also worried about uh, uh, distortion and the reliability of uh, qualitative uh, uh, information. Um, I, I feel personally very uncomfortable working with uh, focus groups uh, because there you can easily cherry pick uh, information flowing out from those focus groups. Uh, there is a danger for con confirmation bias, certainly because many of the Rwandan scholars have turned into activists as well and are also very uh, then active on that front. So I'm very wary about uh, that, that kind of information and those uh, studies. Um, concerning the life histories, I have a bit of a different view. Uh, first of all, there are many life histories. Uh, uh, the, the, the respondents of those life, those life histories were randomly selected in a number of uh, communes 
uh, in Rwanda, the answers uh, and, and, and uh, the, the narratives of change and the rankings are embedded in the life history. So there is a consistency check. It's not just uh, an answer that you give uh, uh, to, to a question. It's embedded in a story. And so there has to be some uh, consistency. Um, also, there is an overlapping period in the life uh, histories. The respondents were visited in 2007 and 2011. And in 2011, the respondents were asked to start telling their story in 2000. So we have an overlapping period, 2000, 2007, that we can use to check, for instance, for recall uh, bias. Uh, so although not perfect, I feel more confident working with these uh, life uh, histories. Um, collecting objective uh, data in Rwanda, yes, uh, I would very much uh, like to do that, but um, well, I've been working on Rwanda since 2002. I've collected my own data in Rwanda. Uh, since a couple of years, I'm just passing through Rwanda with a transit visa on my way to Congo, but I would uh, not think of uh, starting a, a data collection process in Rwanda because it's so tightly controlled and it's impossible to do independent uh, research. Uh, so yes, uh, it would be ideal, but uh, it's not very realistic at this point. Arnie, did you want to? Just a quick point uh, to Paul Mosley's comment. Uh, if you read uh, Andy's summary of what was learned from these studies, his sort of strategic point is that agriculture has been important if you're going to achieve success here. And it reminded me also that I actually was in Taiwan in 1990 and did a paper with Paul Collier on the importance of agriculture for industrial development. There was a whole conference of that. So it's part of the book, and I also talked to the people on the countryside in Rwanda, or the administrators and the policy makers there, asked about their poverty, poverty strategy, and had we never had one, we always focused on productivity, and maybe that's also important. You need strategies, you need policies to implement, and of course we heard in the morning now Stiglitz's plan about how much policy we need, and that makes me slightly worried. Africa seems to me not deficient in policies, but in implementation of policies. So you can't do too complicated things, but the focus on agriculture, I think, is an important and good start anyway in this context. And about Eric then. By the way, Eric was the opponent of my thesis as well. He was everywhere. <laughs> uh, about, he was worried about the inequality figures in uh, Ethiopia. And luckily now they're up. So they're up at 0.39 according to world development indicators anyway, which is up there with the Indias and these guys. So they are no more, no more unequal than Sweden. So. Thank you very much, Arne. Okay, I think we should uh, go for the tea break, but first of all, let's thank the presenters, discussants, and the audience questions. <laughs> <laughs>